Coal is the dirtiest kind of fossil fuel, emitting around twice as much carbon dioxide as natural gas. Washington's new clean power plan plans to adopt clean coal technology to reduce emissions. Later in the program, we'll talk to experts from China and Europe about the latest global trends in coal consumption. But joining me now in the studio to talk about the politics of coal here in the United States is Michael Brewer. He's the president and CEO of American Council on Renewable Energy. And from Tucson, we're joined by Paul Chip Knappenberger, assistant director of the Center for the Study of Science at the Cato Institute. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you for joining us. Paul, let me start with you. We've heard the president's plan. How realistic is it? I think it's pretty tough to pull off. Um, I think that there's a, he's pushing it as a climate urgency, and, and I don't see the climate urgency to, to get those emissions through is, is there. I think it's an interesting plan, but I think it's going to be hard to pull off. Um, Michael, hard to pull off. Uh, there's no emergency. Well, uh, you have to understand from the outset that Chip and I aren't going to agree on this point. Um, because he thinks that there's nothing we can do that will have curative effect either in the United States or in the world. Uh, I disagree. Uh, I agree mostly because lighter is the wound foreseen and we uh, know an environmental wound is coming from fossil fuels. And so we have to do something and we have to do it now and that's what the president is elected to do. This is a bold plan. This is as powerful if it is implemented as the Energy Policy Act of 2005 was in its day. And we need to do this for, the, uh, for our national security, our economic security, and our environmental security. And we need to set the way for uh, the world that the United States is committed to this, uh, just like we showed the way uh, on the beaches of Normandy, quite frankly, uh, that it's bigger than the United States. It's a world matter, and it's time for us to do it, and we can't do it late. I think it was Marcus uh, Priscius, who was Cato the Elder, who said that uh, if you do one thing late, you're going to do everything late. Now, Cato was a farmer, and he knew a lot about the missing opportunities and how climate could affect missing opportunities. Paul, uh as we heard Michael say there, it's bigger than the United States. Something has to be done. Is it your view that nothing should be done? No, it's not my view that nothing should be done. I don't think the approach needs to come from the top. I think it can be a bottoms-up approach to this. And so I don't think we need to force renewables into the energy mix. I think that um, U.S. fossil fuel emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, are on the way down. They're slightly downward trending. So we're sort of going the direction the president wants us to go. And I think what we can, can, what we can achieve in terms of the climate here in the U.S. Is, is pretty low. So I don't think that the U.S. has to um, sort of be a test bed for new technologies, all the while having higher energy prices and perhaps a, a, a less reliable energy source. Those things, we don't know whether that's going to happen. But whether they happen or not, there's, there's nothing that's really going to happen climatically that's going to come from it. Right. You talk about a bottom-up approach. Tell me, who is going to be responsible for that approach? And what does it look like? Well, it's just it's an approach who's responsible for the approach is the American consumers choosing what sort of energy um, they want and what's in the energy mix. So I don't know who's responsible for it. It's the market makes all comers in, in competition playing on a fairly equal level ground. So Michael, do we leave it to the American consumer to decide how these levels of carbon emissions are going to be brought down, to decide what kind of energy they want to use? Well, I, I don't think that Paul's entirely wrong there. I think that we should, uh, should try and learn from each other here. And, He's right, the consumer plays an important role, and we have seen with policy certainty from the federal government mm -hmm. that we are seeing grid parity in the United States for wind power from Texas all the way up to the Canadian border, where we're seeing in the wind industry an average cost of about 4.8 to 9 cents per kilowatt hour for wind. That's an important, and people are buying wind now because of grid parity. We're seeing the same things in California, Arizona, and in the Southwest, where grid parity is bringing these kinds of electricities forward. 
And it's not a question of either or, it's a question of moving it, renewables forward because the, we cannot continue to input more and more carbon into the environment. And so we're going to, by this re regulation, retire existing coal plants. They are old, they're expensive, they're inefficient, and replace them, and that demand equation is exactly what Paul's talking about. The consumers will choose, and we are finding that consumers across the country are picking renewables one time after another and more than fossil fuels. Okay, what about that, Paul? Perfectly fine. Like I said, my only reservation here is the government forcing, um, and essentially forcing renewables in the mix by um, having to reduce the amount of, of fossil fuels based on the, the um, emissions caps that they're um, putting forward. Uh, I'm all for more renewables. I'm not against, those, not against that at all. Okay, you know, this has also become a political football between the president and the opposition in Congress. I want you to listen to what the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, John Boehner, who is uh, an opponent of the president, what he had to say about this plan. Let's listen. And now the president's preparing more EPA rules uh, that could cost uh, more jobs and hurt our economy. It's the same tired anti-business policies that don't work. Michael, is it going to cost jobs? Is it going to hurt the economy? No, the whole notion that renewable energy hurts jobs and hurts the economy is preposterous. And Mr. Boehner's playing a political card, and he's basing his research on debunked uh, studies. In fact, we've seen a growth of renewable energy jobs in this country and a growth of production of renewable energy and all the technology that, incre that increases that ability to build the capacity. This is... This is like any other change that any other economy undergoes, and it's all good for the economy. The supply side and the demand side are working in balance with each other. Okay. Paul, is the plan that the president announced preposterous, uh, as John Boehner contends, and uh, is it based, as Michael just told us, on debunked data? Well, John Boehner's concern, I think, with job loss comes from the idea that the price of electricity, the price of energy is going to go up as you move more expensive energy into the mix or force it into the mix. Um, and so I think that's where it's concerned from there. I, I just think it's, a, it's an economy-wide sort of uh, concern that um, Mr. Boehner is, is expressing there. Okay. Michael, uh, what kind of a battle does the president have in front of him right now? Of course, these, this is a plan. This is a proposal. It's going to go to Congress. There's going to be opposition there. There's probably going to be opposition from the business community as well. So have we got a long way to go? I don't think it's as long ago as, as, as the naysayers say. You know, last week, uh, EPA Administrator McCarthy, when they were rolling this out, says that every time somebody tries to do something uh, material about the pollution of carbon fuel technologies is that everybody in the counter camp starts saying it's the end of the world, that uh, we're going to see job loss, we're going to see increased, increased power, and none of these have ever worked out. In fact, the Reggie Compact in the Northeast rolled out and everybody said, oh, it's going to drive power up and we're going to lose jobs. Well, oh, by the way, now, carbon is reduced by 29% in the Northeast, and the price of electricity is lower than when Reggie started. It's just not true. Okay, let me ask Paul to respond to that. Paul, one other thing I want you to respond to, we're running out of time here, so we're going to have to keep it brief, and that is how fierce is the opposition going to be to the president's plans? No, oh, it's going to, I think it's going to be fierce because I think there's battle lines drawn between Republicans and Democrats, and this is just another issue that's divisive to them. I don't think the president's plan is overly ambitious. I mean, between 2005 and 2012, um, the carbon dioxide from the electricity power producing sector dropped by about half what the president's after. And so because that's why I sort of, yeah. it's okay. because of, um, Right, natural gas replacing coal. Okay, very quickly, Michael. Actually, it's because of energy efficiency, renewables, and natural gas. And it, uh, to those ignore all, all those it. facts, then we're ignoring the entire economic equation. The president's uh, uh, 
program will get through. There are plenty of Republicans to say, yeah, we're going to fight it, but we don't have the legal grounds to stop it. Okay, you get the last word. Michael Bra, Paul Naffenberger, thanks to both of you for joining us. Thanks, Paul. We are going to take a break right now. When we come back, why China is moving away from coal and why U.S. coal exports to Europe have been booming. That's all coming up on The Heat. Stay with us.